Okay, hi everyone. My name's Callie Remillard. I'm a journalist with the Falmouth Enterprise just down the road. I'll give you a little background on me. <clears throat> I just turned 24 years old. I graduated from Northeastern University last May and I came down here to the Cape. I lived in Weymouth my whole life and now I am living down here. So I'm going to talk to you today about bias and blind spots in journalism. So I have a lot of information here. I'm going to try to get through it pretty quickly and I'll take any questions you have. You know, feel free to raise your hand and I'll stop. Um, and then we can do some discussion and debrief at the end. Okay. I want to, I just don't want to, are we, I don't want to start too early. Hey. Hi. Can I sit in on this? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or you can sit at this table. No, I don't, <clears throat> I, I just want to be a fly on the wall. I'm just gonna make sure we don't have any stragglers, so I don't exclude anyone if I start a second early. Oh my goodness! Hi. Hi. Grab a seat. Any stragglers? Is Savannah still a journalist? Yes. We are pretty good. <clears throat> so hi, I'm Callie. For those of you who missed it, Callie Rumlarn with the uh, reporter with the Falmouth Enterprise. I'm 24. I graduated from Northeastern last year, and I'm super excited to be talking to you guys today. So we're going to start with some basics. Um, what exactly is bias, and where does it come from? So psychology today defines bias as a tendency, inclination, or prejudice toward or against something or someone. So there's a couple different kinds. I'm going to focus on these two: implicit and explicit, um, and how they affect news. So explicit bias is a belief that we consciously or deliberately, deliberately hold. We know we have it. It's something we're conscious of. And then implicit bias is a little bit more difficult to understand because it exists outside of our conscious awareness. You can kind of think of it as your brain running on autopilot. Uh, sometimes your brain will make a connection that might seem, might actually be, upon further inspection, a little more biased than you initially thought. But because it exists outside that conscious mind, it'll take you a minute to figure that out. So... So things like biases and the way that we view the world around us has a lot to do with where we stand in it. And that concept, that intersection of all of our identities is called intersectionality. And it incorporates everything like our race, our gender, sexuality, economic status, political ideas, all of that comes together to help form how you see the world. So just a little pop out on that. Intersectionality was actually something I first learned about in college. It was a term coined coined by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw in 89. Um, and it's a way to understand, an anal it's an analytical framework to help understand different types of discrimination, how they affect different types of identities, and the intersection of various different identities. <clears throat> so just to give you a little bit of an example, a straight white man from a conservative town will likely have a different worldview than a black woman who grew up in a more liberal city. You know, just pretty basic things. They've lived different lives. They're going to look at the world differently. So I figured this could be a moment maybe just for some quiet reflection if anybody wants to share. Maybe this is the first time you're thinking about your identity in this way. So um, I'll share with you. I'm a white cisgender queer woman. I identify as a lesbian. I grew up in the New England area. I'm college educated, middle class. Um, I'm a journalist. I enjoy, I enjoy reading. I enjoy writing. I'm a pretty outgoing person. And that's me. So I don't know if anybody else feels comfortable sharing or maybe taking some notes. I'll, get, I'll give you a second to do that. Yeah. Um, I'm so old school. Can you define for me what cisgender means? Yeah, of course. So cisgendered is basically um, just a shorthanded way of saying I was born a female at birth. So cisgendered is you are you currently identify with the same gender with, with which you were born. So I was born female and I still identify as female. Hi. Grab a seat wherever. Any other questions on this side or intersectionality, anything like that? Okay. All right, so now I want to transition to talking to you <clears throat> about journalism, bias, and objectivity, or at least what objectivity did mean in journalism at one point. So by definition, 
to be objective is to be absent of all influence of personal feelings, cultural biases, uh, when representing the facts. Walter Lippmann, he was a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist back in the early 1900s, and he was one of the first to call for a scientific approach to journalism when it came to an analysis of the facts and a present presentation of the news. The point of it was basically to eliminate objective um, bias as much as possible. As you can see in this quote from the American Press Institute, the concept of objectivity was originally intended to be imposed on the method of testing information and getting that information rather than being imposed on the person doing, doing that, that reporting themselves. Um, Objectivity was actually taken so seriously at one point, though, that reporters themselves refrained from voting because they didn't want to appear biased um, to one political candidate or another. We've learned in recent elections that that way of doing things isn't really the way we do society anymore. So how can we rethink objectivity with bias in journalism in the 21st century? So. I want to first make it clear that we want to apply the concept of objectivity to the method and not the journalist. Because when you apply it to the journalist, some pretty messy things can happen. First of which is that your stories are going to lack a clear voice. By tiptoeing around hard truths and facts of the world, or whatever event is going on that you're reporting on, in order to not appear biased, you're actually not doing a good service to journalism. Because sometimes, in messy situations, a journalist needs to find the facts and stand by them. Without a clear voice, without standing on those facts, it's not clear what message you're conveying. And that's something you always need to be thinking about as a journalist. What am I saying here, and where do I stand? You also end up with something I heard about in college called both sidesism. So this is something that happens when reporters feel obligated to report on both sides of any issue, no matter how dangerous or kind of out there one side of that rhetoric might be. This can often lead to the spread of harmful or misinformation. I know this sounds like a little bit of like a like an idea, but I do have an example for you. So these are some quotes from what I'm about to talk about. Um, so recently, Dr. Phil came under some scrutiny for what he did on his TV show. He's a conservative talk show host, for those of you who don't know. Um, and he recently invited a non-binary couple, Ethan and Addison, um, onto his show to discuss gender identity and pronouns and kind of share their experiences and be like, here's, tell me what your experience with this side of the gender experience is. It was a great start. But things went downhill very shortly after when Dr. Phil also brought out Matt Walsh, who's a known right-wing commentator, big on Twitter, not necessarily the nicest in his deliverance of opinions. Um, note that I said opinion there and not facts, because that's really what he did. He came out and he delivered opinions. And um, this resulted not only, only in the spread of harmful messaging that was pretty damaging to the LGBTQ community, but it also resorted to kind of downright bullying on TV. And this person was pretty much asking these two non-binary people to explain why they should exist. And it was really tough to watch. So what, what Dr. Phil did here was really give a bullhorn to a person with a pretty bad track record of spreading harmful opinions on marginalized communities and passing these off as facts. I'm not saying that this person isn't allowed to say what they said. That's not what I'm saying at all. That's freedom of speech. They are allowed to say that. But what I want you to join me in thinking about is whether or not it was beneficial to give a national television platform to that kind of a, of a rhetoric coming from a person with a negative track record of rallying people online in a somewhat violent way. Especially when that opposition is rooted not as much in facts, but in just their personal moral op opposition to the issue, which happened to be gender and pronouns. So that's just something I want you to think about. It looked to me like a pretty perfect example of both sidesism, which is a tough issue to get into. Um, it's not necessarily a malicious intent by Dr. Phil. I mean, reminder that he is a conservative talk show host. So, you know, it was, it was 
good that they were talking about it on that platform, but the way that it went down was perhaps not the best. And that's something I'd like you to think about as we move forward. I have this quote from Layla Lalami. She's a journalist with The Nation, which is an abolitionist fund founded uh, progressive paper. She writes, this is not to say there isn't value in providing different perspectives on an issue, but to give print space or airtime to surrogates who repeat dishonest talking points or engage in bad faith arguments only distorts that context. Handing a bullhorn to both sides isn't objective. It's merely relinquishing the responsibility to inform the public. So I'll let you think about that for a second. I have a video I'm gonna set up. Sometimes when people say, are you, are, you, are you guys completely neutral? No, we're not robots. Journalists are human beings, and I think every human being has, whether it's bias or prejudge or however we're brought up, um, we have influences in our lives, so we see things differently. The best thing that we do is just, one, acknowledge that we're not all the same. We don't want to be same, all the same. We want diverse people in the newsroom. But also, to be what's fair. I think that's more, more rational to me is, because I... As a human, I, we all have our, our biases of various things. It can be based on religion, gender, age, worldview, politics, a lot of things. But when you're talking about reporting, hard news reporting, it's what do I know and what can I verify? Everyone comes to journalism, their work, whatever their work is, with a worldview based on their own life experiences. So the fact that I am a black woman influences my worldview, the fact that I'm a southerner influences my worldview, and I think that they can ultimately make reporting richer, but those things, when you're in a place that is a strong journalistic institution, um, come up against, you know, your editor and your editor's, you know, worldview or um, unconscious bias. I think what what we do for one another is sort of find holes in blind spots. And also, as a reporter, because I'm aware that I am all those things and that they influence my worldview, it's also about reading widely um, from other perspectives, um, interviewing people. Well, one thing you you don't do is you allow people to you allow one one source story to run. So stories before they hit the paper, before they're published online, um, we're required to talk to more than one source in a story. So um, sources on another side of the issue will check. I, I think that they check and balance e each other's biases out. I think the way that you confront bias um, through journalistic tools is really by looking at what people are saying to you and really trying to verify them independently. So even if you feel sorry for someone who's grieving their lost child, if they tell you that they've never had a run-in with the law, that they were a straight-A student, before I print that, I want to go try to see if I can figure out, did he have a record? I want to figure out what school did he go to? Do his teachers also say that? So even though it can be in some ways kind of cold to think, oh, you have to go verify what a mother's telling you, the same way I try to verify if a police officer says, this officer was clean, He's ne he never had any issues, I want to I want a FOIA and I want to go through a Freedom of Information Act and say, well, let me see those papers for myself. Let me verify for myself what the papers say and what your department has said about him. So I think you have to really just look at both point of view. Because even though a grieving mother doesn't mean to lie to you, it could be that she's just really overcome with grief and everyone thinks their child is an amazing person and everyone wants to think, especially if you've hired someone and they've been in your police force, you want to think that they 
understand and respect the integrity I'm that, so you sorry. And that, you, that you hope that they're in line with the rest of the department. I think that I understand that I'm a black it. woman with an afro and that when I'm asking people questions that they look at me and think, okay, she must have, she must be a protester sympathizer or she must understand and, and have all these different experiences. But I think that I have a brother who's a police officer and I have a brother who's also had run in with the law. And I think that in both those cases, I have this idea of what people go through. I have, the, I have people, I have family members who are out on the line, who are risking their lives for people's freedoms, for people's safety. And I also have family members who feel like they're, they've somehow been targeted by police officers. So I think in my own personal reporting, I have those two competing things. And I think that that's kind of why I try to report the way I report, because I think I'm not, I'm not blind. I know what I look like. I know my race. So I don't try to ever dance around the fact that I'm black American. And I don't try to ever tell people like, oh, I don't know anything about this. Who would know what racial profiling is? I'm like, no, I understand what racial profiling is. I understand what black American men feel like in this country. But I also, surprisingly to some people, understand what police officers go to and talk to people and love someone who is out there with a gun trying to save people's lives. People are biased. The process is not. You know, we go out, we, we talk to multiple people. We look at a story from multiple different angles. We fact check. You know, I have editors who scrutinize my work. You, you trust the process, and the process is it's designed to strip away you know, all of those, those biases that otherwise could find their way into a story. This isn't something that we take lightly. You know, we're not, you know, you can't be so arrogant that you think you're going to go into a situation and that you know everything there is to know about it. You, it, it just doesn't work like that. I mean, I think reporters are curious people in general. So you, you, you go into a story and we want to hear a new perspective. We want to, 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 to piece things together and get a complete picture of something. Part of our job is is to give people as much information as we can, to give it to them in a fair and reasonable way. And when you talk about trying to keep track of our biases, or, or how do we keep track of our biases, we can do it by trying to disconnect a little emotionally. We can do it by pursuing uh, direct, um, relentless questioning of people that we might like and respect. And it also means that if we find good attributes and a good story with somebody that we don't like and don't respect, we need to be willing to tell that story too. Okay, so that was that video. It's a little bit old, but I think it does a pretty good job. Um, did anyone have any thoughts they wanted to share? That's okay, because I do. So <laughs> we can get into mine. Um, I want to talk about this woman. I believe I pronounced her name Yamiche, Yamichi Alcindor. I hope I'm saying that right. I really do. Um, she was a reporter for USA Today. She now reports for NBC News and PBS. And like she said in the clip, she is a black woman, um, and she has one brother who's a cop and one brother who's had past run-ins with the law. She says in the clip that as a black journalist, she's aware of the fact that people may look at her and see the color of her skin and her hair and assume that she's a protest sympathizer, um, which is a perfect example of bias in that person because the reality is she's a lot more complex than that. We all are. So she has insight into both sides of this issue, looking at her brothers um, and their two very different lifestyles that are often at odds with each other. Um, and she uses this knowledge as an advantage in her reporting. She takes into account experiences she's, she's had with both of these groups, living with them, experiencing how they live, seeing things like she talked about, like race, racial profiling, and she's aware of the fact that she has these experiences. But she doesn't let her feelings or her personal opinions about either group get in the way of her reporting because she focuses on the facts. She uses her experience to bridge a gap for her readers who might not have the same knowledge that she does, but by focusing on the facts, she maintains her journalistic objectivity. <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> Whew, okay, uh, so times are changing, so are our ideals. Objectivity, like I said earlier, is a pretty old concept from the early 20th century. 
Um, that's not to say it's bad. I'm not trying to tell you objectivity is bad. It's a great standard and should be used for all journalists because it's what keeps our news unbiased and truthful. But objectivity, as it was traditionally interpreted back in the 1900s, adheres to facts and truths that have generally been deemed objective by a mainstream white male standard. And if you look around our world today, you'll realize that things have changed. That's really not the makeup of our world today. We have all different kinds of people and they deserve to be represented. So when you think about it, really, the concept of objectivity predates the civil rights movement of the 1960s. It predates segregation. So when you think about that default setting, it really is really different. So I want to get all of us thinking together about how we can rethink objectivity and the way we define it. So I wanna ask if anyone has any ideas. What does objectivity mean to you? Maybe this is the first time you're really thinking about it. Maybe you've heard about this a lot. If you have any ideas, if you don't, that's okay too. Like in terms of like now or like? Anything, now, then, yesterday, tomorrow. <laughs> that's okay, because I'm, I'm here to teach you about it. So let's recap. So we're gonna redefine it together. We're gonna start with what the old was. So journalists must be objective and must strip themselves of their identities and effectively check them, their real selves and their real personalities at the newsroom door. Like I said earlier, journalists didn't vote because they didn't wanna show partial deference to any um, particular candidate, which obviously today that wouldn't fly. So our new way of looking at it is going to be that the method of reporting and the product of that of reporting must be objective. Because as long as your method is objective and honest in its pursuit of facts, then you're doing your job as a journalist correctly. But as journalists, it's important to remember the root of our jobs. We're seekers of truth, and as seekers of truth, we have an obligation to provide all contexts, perspectives, and voices, especially those that are traditionally excluded. Because if we don't, then who will? Okay, so. This is Lewis Raven Wallace. He is an award-winning journalist. He is a trans man, and he's the author of this book, The View from Somewhere, Undoing the Myth of Journalistic Objectivity. I read it in college. It's an amazing book. I highly recommend. Um, so he wrote a blog post on Medium in 2017 titled, Objectivity is Dead, and I'm Okay with It. And in it, he wrote about his experience as a trans journalist who was never neutral on the subject of his own rights, even as they were being debated right in front of him in both sides of journalism. So he suggested that instead of pretending there is no why to what we do as journalists, we should claim our values. We should stand against things that propose to chip away at things like free speech and civil rights and other pillars of the free world that we enjoy living in. Because if we, as journalists, aren't doing this, again I ask, who will? He says that we deserve a journalism that rigorously pursues verifiable facts while claiming a moral stance uh, and fight back things like racism, xenophobia, transphobia. While we can't eliminate it entirely from society, what we can do is limit the space that these harmful ideas or misinformation that comes from these ideas get in our news. Through that, we can build back trust with our audiences and we can challenge and change the way we think about truth and the way we think about our news. And by talking about these issues, whether it's firsthand, like Lewis Raven Wallace did, or secondhand, by telling someone else's story, um, we're able to legitimize these debates as journalists. And through that, kind of reclaim a lost form of journalism that's about really connecting with people and sharing those lost stories and voices and open up a whole new avenue for looking at change. It can really, really open up a whole new world. I'm sure you're wondering, how can I do that? It's actually really simple. You bring your experiences in an upfront and honest way. That's what Lewis Raven Wallace did, and that's what Wesley Lowry did when he, a black man, was arrested while reporting on the front lines of the protests in Ferguson, Missouri, in the wake of Michael Brown's death at the hands of police. Their experiences living through the things that they were reporting on changed the way that they reported on them. 
because the things that they were the things that they were reporting on were affecting not just their communities but actually their person their being directly wesley lowry was actually thrown in jail he had a press pass and the police didn't care he was a black man at a protest and that was really an awakening for him so to remember this thing about your experiences i made a fun little equation um your experiences plus your knowledge plus those reliable and relevant sources that you have to fill in any gaps that you may have found when you did a little look of your own, of your own inventory, plus your constant dedication to factual and truthful reporting as a journalist will always equal good, thought-provoking news. I'll give you a sec if you guys want to write that down. I'm also okay with if you want to take pictures of the slides. Um, that's what I <laughs> did in college, so I'm totally okay if I see you Oh, uh, taking out your phone. I'm okay with that. Can I ask you a question? Please. Um, so, are you registered to vote? Yes. And do you declare a party? Um, I actually didn't. I declared independent. Right. And is that because you're a journalist, or is that because that's truly how you feel? I think that's just because I first registered when I was 18 and I wasn't sure. But if I, actually, I think I should be re-registering now that I'm down in Cape Cod, so that might be changing. <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. <laughs> Is everyone good with this slide? Cool. Okay, so I mentioned Wesley Lowry. That's him. That's the book he wrote. Read that in college as well. Very powerful. It's called They Can't Kill Us All the story of Black Lives Matter. So I mentioned him and I want to talk about how um, he, wrote, he wrote in his book that a reckoning over objectivity was coming. And I think he's right. And I think we may have gotten there. So I want to talk about an issue that you might have seen on social media when it happened in 2020. Um, it's the case of Alexis Johnson. So Alexis Johnson is a black female journalist who is working for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette in the wake of the George Floyd uh, protests. There was a lot of misinformation online regarding things like looting and where it was happening, who was doing it, why. So Alexis Johnson tweeted this. She wrote, horrifying scenes and aftermath from selfish looters who don't care about this city. Oh wait, sorry, no, these are pictures from a Kenny Chesney concert tailgate. Whoops. A laugh, right? It's silly. Is it professional? Perhaps not. But is it funny? And is it accurate? Yeah. So she posted this tweet and she was removed from protest coverage the next morning. Um, her bosses told her that she was no longer allowed to cover the protest because she had violated the company's social media guidelines and claimed that her tweet showed that she was biased. Just about everyone else in America, I mean, look at those interactions. Um, people all over the world, her union, prominent journalists on social media, celebrities even, called for her to be reinstated to protest coverage. Unfortunately, she was not. She ended up resigning in October um, and announced a job at Vice shortly thereafter. Now, while I want your thoughts on this, there is more to the story that I think might change how you feel. Okay, so this bit is directly from CNN. A white male reporter who also tweeted about the protests was spoken to by editors, but was only given a warning, according to Johnson. The reporter was removed from protest coverage only after Guild representatives brought up the issue during their meeting. Johnson declined to identify the reporter, but she did give them a quote. They need to take a look at why they made that decision, she told CNN. They may very well thought I violated the guidelines, but I guess they need to think about why they felt so strongly about that and not a white male reporter. Does that change how you feel about it at all? Does anybody want to share their thoughts? If, if you wanted time to think, I have more quotes to read you. I'll read you some more quotes. It's also worth noting that fellow Pittsburgh Post-Gazette reporter and Guild Union president, Mike Fuoco, said that the Pittsburgh Polk Gazette actually doesn't have a set social media um, policy. Uh, nothing is really tangible for that. 
And he actually defended Alexis Johnson's tweet and called it food for thought with a touch of humor. He also said that he thinks that Johnson should be on protest coverage more than anyone else in their newsroom because of her experience as a black woman. This quote from him, in my view, there are no two ways of looking at racism. It is wrong. The fact that she, the fact that the company thinks her tweeting disqualifies her is disingenuous. She has more understanding about being a black woman than white reporters and photographers. So looking at that tweet, what do you guys, what do you guys think of the outcome of this situation? What does it make you feel? Yeah. I think like a lot of stuff has happened like this before or like similar to it. And like, I think it's definitely like a problem and like, it's just like, it is wrong, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. I don't know, yeah. Definitely, yeah. So I mean, I just think it's, it's, it's a good case for, you know, how you, you really like, like, I mean, it's, it's not a very professional tweet, like you said, but still, I mean, you have to sort of recognize that something like that is just obviously sort of, you know, like something that needs to be said at some point. Right. And so, you know, it... I totally agree. It, I would say. Well, yeah, so I think this next quote, too, um... So this next is from an article written by Gina Valeria for Pointer. These are some uh, facts. I'm going to read the quote to you. It's a bit long. She says, What reporter Alexis Johnson was actually doing was pointing out an important truth and giving context to an important story. She was illustrating how the same behavior is, con is condoned when perpetrated by white mainstream society and vilified when undertaken by people of color. Her perspective is actually needed as we navigate coverage of this important and ongoing story. Her personal objectivity isn't. With this tweet, Alexis Johnson took a position, one that her background, ethnicity, and experience made her uniquely qualified to explore and contextualize. And she was right. She was accurate. She was transparent. She was practicing solid journalism. Objectivity was represented in the process of vetting the photo, assessing the story, and providing the information to increase understanding. So I think that all goes to show that while her management tried to dock her on a lack of objectivity, when you look at it, she actually was pretty objective. She was pretty clear on what she was saying and how she did it, and she did it all in 180 characters. I mean, that's journalism to me. So anyone else have any, any last thoughts on the case of Alexis Johnson? Okay. All right. This is one of my last slides. So these are Helen's spheres. I love these things and I'm so excited to explain them to you. So they were created by Daniel Hallen in 1986 uh, in his book about media coverage of the Vietnam War. And basically what he said is that everything journalism touches can fit into one of these three spheres. So we're gonna start with the sphere of consensus, which is this guy in the middle. The things that go in there are things that journalists can say without having to look over our shoulder and be like, oh, am I biased for that? Is anyone going to get mad that I said that? Pretty basic things like, you know, slavery is wrong, crime is bad, people deserve food and water, democracy is a good form of government. These are all things that we take as a given to be said in the news, and you don't really have to bring someone in from the other side to argue, actually, slavery was pretty good. Like, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> but... This slavery is wrong thing was once all the way out here. We are going to talk about that, though. So here we have the sphere of legitimate controversy. This is where most of the journalist work takes place. You see it often with uh, like bipartisan issues. Should taxes be higher or lower? Democrats did this. Um, policy issues. You see it with climate change. Recently, we've seen a lot of debate over the effects, over how to move forward, whose fault is it, all that kind of stuff. And like I said, matters of public policy. So here is where journalists see themselves as being part of an active debate to find a correct path forward. The balance there of the journalists, of their job, is pretty critical because you're acting as brokers of a lot of different news coming in from all these different sides. And you need to, your job is to determine the facts and what goes forward to print. So... I want to move out to the sphere of deviance now. This is where you'll find pretty much anything else. These are things, I guess you could sum it up as like not for polite society, but really anything you wouldn't talk about at like 
the dinner table. I got not that you talk about politics at the dinner table, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, so I'm talking about things like hot takes or conspiracy theories, something you saw on YouTube or TikTok, crazy stuff, or political extremisms. You know, we've seen that in the news, unfortunately. Things can get really negative, and that's all the way out here. But I'm also, there's also some things that are kind of been, they've been condemned out here for the past maybe 10, 20 years, but we're starting to see some movement. I'm talking about things like abortion, abolish or defund the police, wealth redistribution, Black Lives Matter, racial, racial movements, and trans rights. So all of these things, once upon a time, they all existed out here. Back when I was in high school in 2016, really none of this was in the news at all. That's when I graduated high school, 2016, and not a lot of this was in the news. But just thinking about your guys' high school experience, I mean, how many of you have seen at least one of these things in the news? Right, that's what I thought. So the main point that I want you to know about these spheres is that ideas move between them. And they move between them because opinions change. So how does this all happen? Shifts in public opinion happen when people start thinking and talking. And journalists are in a very, very special position where they are poised to, with honest reporting and good sources, get people talking about a new topic that could really create change. We saw Alexis Johnson do it. We saw Lewis Raven Wallace do it when he would not debate his rights as a trans person. We saw Wesley Lowry do it when he would not debate his validity as a black man. And we see these things slowly move from being not talked about five years ago, not being talked about two years ago, to being here all of a sudden, being the main news that we see. And knowing that that change is possible just by getting people talking is really, really important. And sometimes it means journalists have to take a stand. All of these people took their stands. And you, when, when you take a stand as a journalist, you have to make sure that you're right. You have to make sure you have your facts. You have to make sure that the ground you're standing on is solid. And these people did that, and they did it right, and change ensued. So I just want you guys to know that although journalism and activism don't necessarily go hand in hand all of the time, there is a way to have a healthy mix, and one when can lead to the other. And when they're done correctly, it can lead to some real social change. Yeah. Um, I think this might be a silly question, but... Oh, no silly I'm questions. Curious, do you know any, like, examples of, like, big issues that have, like... Or, like, I guess they're not have big issues if they're in this, but have moved not, like, outwards in, but, like, that were in this, like, center sphere and have moved out? I mean, yeah, so I did have some notes that I appeared to have skipped over, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so once upon a time, women's rights was out here. Back 100 years ago, before women had the right to own property, the right to vote, before, blacks, uh, before schools were desegregated and you know, black and white people were kept very separately, all of those were out here. And that has moved slowly over time, things have moved in. So on the inverse, I guess you could say that the sphere of consensus, uh, let's look at segregation, right? Maybe once upon a time, based on those ideas that were perpetuated by the white men in charge in the 1800s, segregation was the vibe. Segregation was what we did. Obviously, things changed. So you saw that move out. And while I'm not saying that, I mean, I'm, the idea is that everyone can agree slavery is wrong. The unfortunate truth is probably not everyone does. And that would put the inverse of that all the way out here. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like if with you know, like segregation, like it might have been like segregation is good in the middle and segregation is bad on the outside. And then both of them might have moved into the middle and it would have been like just segregation and then yes. it would have reversed. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And that's all, all ideas are fluid and can move like that. And that's what I want you to get out of this. Yeah, I saw a hand. Oh yeah. I was just going to say, I feel like you could flip any of those statements around and then they would become like the outside. Yeah, you really could. I mean, that's, that's the fun thing about this. I did a lot of research into these spheres and 
a lot of things and how they move and how they move over time and it's it's fascinating i do encourage you to you know think about things in this way it's a very if, especially if you're looking at if you're thinking about becoming a journalist or you have an interest in writing just even knowing that even seeing it kind of put i really wish i could have gotten the graphics because i wanted to get these to move in but i couldn't figure it out i'm not that tech savvy and i want to see that for you guys so bad because even just being able to see wait me writing an article and then getting someone to read it and then getting that person thinking and then that person talks to their friend, that's real change, that matters. It may seem like it's on a really small scale, but it does matter. In my, on my laptop, I have a Google Drive saved of countless emails and messages I've gotten from people I've interviewed or written about being like, thank you so much. You did this justice, you were so great to work, whatever it may be. And I just have them saved because sometimes you need to look back and be like, okay, I've done, I've done things. I've made change. I've made small changes. I've made big changes. I'm, the work I'm doing matters. And that's, that's what I want you guys to know. All of this work, all this work that journalists do, it matters. And you can all be journalists. It really just takes a little courage to own who you are and not be afraid to be shot down just in case. And the dedication to finding the truth and sharing that truth. So I do have a little bit of a wrap up slide for you guys. I won't read through all of it because I just talked to you guys a lot <laughs> and I'm feeling really sweaty under this mask. Um, I'll leave that up there for a second, but I do also have a fun QR code, which is also on my cards. Um, I'll switch it back to here. If you want the QR code, let me know. But now is the time where I'd love to take any of your questions, comments, anything. Yeah. Has there ever been something you were reporting on that, you know, objectivity versus your own personal feelings, like, that you ever struggled hard with, like, being the journalist in that situation? Yeah. So, um, speaking as a reporter who is gay, um, being on Cape Cod, I came from the city, and it was a little bit of a change. Not that Cape Cod isn't, isn't welcoming because it is but I remember when I first got here there was some some evidence of just a silly little hate crime someone some anti-gay something happened that was really really troubling for me it wasn't even my story but we talked about it in our editorial meeting and that it just really troubled me to think oh I'm so open about who I am and I never think about the fact that that could come back to me negatively someday and it kind of was like a scary moment to think for a second but I have such a great support system at work that I was able to you know go to the people that I report to and have a very candid conversation and be like is this something that happens a lot and it's not I mean I'm sure living on Cape Cod you guys know it's not an entirely hateful community it's usually very welcoming but even just seeing that, it was pretty hard because I'm not the only um, LGBTQ person in, in our newsroom. And I'm grateful it was not my story to report on because I do feel as though my personal bias would have perhaps made it a bit hard for me. But that's a challenge I'm, I'm willing to take. Let's hope it doesn't happen again. But if it does, I will step up to the plate and I will write that story. But yeah, yeah. Is there ever like good bias in like Yes. Oh my gosh. There's so much good bias. So much good bias. I don't. So I don't want you to think of it as a bias. I want you to think of it as your knowledge. Your knowledge helps you in journalism. Just because I'm a, an LGBTQ woman who took women's studies courses in, in college and feels strongly about women's rights, I'm not biased against men. You know what I mean? I'm just really passionate and I have knowledge to back up the whole women's part of my identity. Do you know what I mean? So I want you to think about your, when you take stock of your biases, opinions, feelings, I don't necessarily want you to stick the word bias on everything because it's not all bias. Some of it is just knowledge. Some of it is just your experience. And it doesn't have to be bias. You can use these things to your advantage, to elevate your reporting, to elevate the connections you're making. 
And really, when it comes to reporting, it's all about connections. And if you're part of different communities and you have those connections, your reach is only going to be greater. And it's only going to elevate those stories that you get and those viewpoints that you can broaden. Yeah? Can you give us an example of a story where your intersectionality actually helped you to make change? Yeah, so I actually had a whole slide that I didn't show you guys about all of my stories. <laughs> I cut it because I thought it was too long to talk about myself, but I'll kind of brief you. Um, so I was diagnosed with endometriosis when I was in high school. It is a debilitating disease that affects one in 10 women. Uh, it's a disability. I've written about it a lot. I wrote specifically about the politicization of birth control during the Trump administration because birth control is my medication. I take it uh, daily. Um, and without it, I would not be able to stand in front of you right now. I'd be in pain in bed. So I've written a lot about that. Um, I've written specifically, one of my favorite articles was a look at this one specific mandate in New Jersey um, that did not allow lesbian women to pursue fertility treatment. Um, these were all articles I did while I was in college, but I wrote a story about being gay and Greek because I came out while I was in Greek life, which was an interesting experience. Um, and then I wrote a story about rebuilding myself. Um, that goes into my time I spent abroad where I had removed myself from like my whole life here and as a freshman in college started over in a new way, which was so beneficial to me in so many ways. I've written about women in sports media. I also majored in um, sports media in college, women's studies and sports media and journalism. So um, I wrote about sports media and the face, um, the abuse that women face in sports media, whether you're an athlete, a coach, a ref, a reporter. Um, and that was it, was, it was really interesting to dive into a lot of these things. These were all very personal. And then I kind of shifted to as I got to Falmouth, um, of course, I'm not writing as many personal essays or term papers anymore. Um, but in an area that is very largely, you know, white, I did try to find a diverse voices where I could and when it was appropriate. Um, I spoke to this woman. She was a Ukrainian-born, uh, now a Falmouth resident. We were on the phone for over an hour, and she cried to me while she told me about her family's experience fleeing uh, the country after World War II when she was just a baby and she was very emotional telling me about how it feels to relive that all today and I was I could never have related to that story on my own but hearing it from her hearing that emotion and then being trusted to write about it for her was such an honor and that's an honor I hope to continue to do for for the rest of my life doing this kind of work and I hope that I've inspired you guys a little bit to maybe pursue some of the same. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have about literally anything. Um, and if we can't get to your questions now, my contact info is in the cards. Please email, call, text, Instagram. I don't care, whatever you do. If you want to get in touch, I'm here for you guys. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you.